Um, James chapter 1 and 2 Samuel chapter 1, and tonight's going to be a lot of teaching. I hope you will write in, and I'll encourage you, if you don't have a pen, to try to get one and write in some things. This will be more of a teaching message, and I want to say right off the bat that I did not come up with the outline myself. I, I read this here a while back, and, and uh, I liked it so much, I just thought, I'm going to kind of use it as a framework from which to have a to deal when we come into David here. Now, we've been preaching through the life of David for quite a while. We've seen David's just amazing story, shepherd boy, blessed of God, favored of God, used of God, power of God, just an amazing story. But we're fixing to, we're fixing to turn the page into a tragic, tragic time in David's life. We've preached all the way up to this chapter. And this is one of the most known things about David, as far as when people think about David. But David's life is never going to be the same after this. And I almost just like, Lord, I just want to stop right here. I just want to stop David's life here and let's go preach on something else. But we can't do that. And uh, But if you ever doubt the grace of God, if you ever doubt the mercy of God, just think on this for a while. And I am so thankful that God included this in the record of history, David's history. I'm so glad for the Psalms that David recorded as a result of this. And uh, so we're going to read uh, a few chapters here, and then I'm going to, not chapters, a few verses. But let's look at chapter 11, 2 Samuel, verse number 1. And it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him in all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon, besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed, walked upon the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam? And the wife the wife of Uriah the Hittite. David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and, when he, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And we're going to quit at verse 5. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am a child. David uh, dealt with right here what in the Bible is taught as temptation. Not a lot preached and taught about temptation seem like in churches anymore. You just, you know, you hear something, but Really dealing with the reality of temptations is kind of void, it's kind of avoided. It really is. It's just I don't know. It's kind of like we just kind of it's back over here somewhere, and yet it's one of the biggest subjects in the Bible. Uh, Eve fell through temptation. Start, sin starts out with temptation, and tonight we're just going to do a lesson on on temptation. Let's look at James chapter one, verse two. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, uh, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, knowing that, that you may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. I jump to verse number 12 for sake of time. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord had promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Father, we pray now tonight that you help us to feed the flock of God. Lord, that we would personally apply these things and learn from them. Lord, God, you've recorded them given to us for our learning. Lord, for our spiritual growth and strength and wisdom, Lord, God, I pray that you'd help us tonight uh, to uh, get a hold of this thing. I pray it'd be a help to these people. Uh, Lord, I pray the truths about temptation, Lord, would just be laid out on the table, and we'd be honest about it as you're honest about it in your word. And Lord, I pray again that we'll not just be hearers of the word, but doers also in Jesus' name, amen. Um, I'm going to read to you tonight. Some sad statistics. 
this uh, survey is part of a three-part survey. It was taken in 2016, so that's just last year. It involves about 3,000 pastors, okay? All together, it involves about 3,000 pastors. Uh, but here are some statistics concerning the ministry. So you can take it for whatever in your life. 1,500 pastors a month leave the ministry due to one of three things, moral failure, spiritual burnout, or contention in churches. 1,500 pastors a month. That would be how many a day? 50? That would be 50, three times 50, 50 30 days. It would be 50 a day, wouldn't it? Can you imagine, can you comprehend that, that 50 pastors a day are quitting the ministry over one of those three things? And moral, moral failure is the number one. 50% of pastors' marriages end in divorce in America right now. 50% of pastors' marriages end in divorce right now. 50% of pastors that are in ministry right now would leave the ministry if they could find other work to do. 80% of seminary and Bible school graduates who enter the ministry this year will have left the ministry within five years. 40% of pastors surveyed said that they have literally and physically committed adultery with someone besides their wife. 70% said that the only time they study the Bible is when they're preparing a sermon. Seventy-seven percent said they do not have what they would call a good marriage. This is pastors in America. Seventy percent, over seventy percent, said that they do not have a one personal, one person that they call a personal friend. Seventy-seven percent of pastors said they don't have one person that they can call a personal friend. Seventy-five percent admit to being extremely stressed out. And this one here just blew me away. They don't have a percentage on this. They just say that's a small percentage. Only a small percentage of pastors' children in America now stay in the church after they're grown or keep the faith. It's so small, it's not hardly registers. 40% have serious conflict with their church members every month. 40% have not just light, but serious conflict with their church members every month. 33% said they felt the ministry was absolutely hazardous to their, their family, their personal family's welfare. 70% of pastors in America said, that America said they're constantly fighting depression. Another survey said that 63% of pastors say that they struggle with sexual addic addic addiction, or in other words, pornography or something related to that, 63%. This is a 2016 survey. You want, to get, you want to get in the ministry? Uh, we're getting ready to jump off into David's life, and I'm, I'm not going to do just a... Now, next Sunday, I'm, we're going to, I'm going to preach a message entitled The Lion of Lust, and, and I'm going to do something that God did for me here a while back that helped me have a visualization of what Satan will do to a person. Okay, and you'll see that next Sunday. So I, I want to encourage you. To be here next Sunday, I think it'll be a blessing to you, help to you. Uh, we're going to have some stuff on the wall that uh, I think will uh, hopefully will forever imprint on your mind the danger of immorality. This is a critical area. It's not just a little area uh, that David's failure here is in. The Bible said many strong men have been taken. Uh, as I said earlier, David's life will never be the same again. Uh, David is not a young man when this occurs. It's not like he it was just a teenage boy running around. He had several wives at this time. Several children had been down the road of life. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 6 on Sunday morning in Bible class, and we're talking about spiritual warfare, putting on the whole armor of God. There is an area about that that we have not discussed, and that is being morally strong when we talk about being strong in the Lord. If you have your hand out tonight, what I would write at the top of that, I would write the truth about temptations, the truth about temptations. And uh, we're going to be, as I said, looking at these things, and you can just fill in the blanks. And I just did this to kind of maybe help you get a little more out of it than just sitting there and listening uh, to me. But this is kind of a side study area to uh, David's uh, life. 
and it's about the area of temptation. And, uh, you know, boy, you look at David's life and you think, my land, my land, boy, you know, what it could have been if he would have just not, this one situation that would not have nailed him. And, of course, we are going to look at the repercussions and the consequences to his family and stuff. But there's three. So I would write down the truth uh, about temptation. But before we get into filling in these blanks, let me just say that most people know that there's the world, the flesh, and the devil. And somebody has said we have the external world we're dealing with, fighting in our spiritual warfare. We have the internal flesh, but we have the inter- infernal devil. And boy, I'm telling you something. So we have a fight constantly going on, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Now watch this. As far as the devil's concerned, twice the Bible calls Satan the tempter. The tempter. In Revelation, Matthew chapter 4, verse 3, he's called the tempter. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5, Satan is called the tempter. And uh, now there's a difference tonight, and I want to get this laid out early. There's a difference between being tried and being tempted. And you need to get, we all need to get this down. But I'm going to be honest with you. There are times in my life when I'm not sure whether I'm being tried by the Lord or whether I'm being tempted by the devil. You say, well, you ought to be able to figure that out. I'm sorry, I'm just not there yet. Sometimes I, I just haven't figured it all out. But the Bible's very clear about this, that trials come from God and therefore our spiritual growth. And you're going to have them. God is going to send trials into your life and therefore your spiritual growth. Temptations come from Satan and they are to cause you to sin and to fall. Trials come from God, therefore your spiritual strengthening. Temptation comes from Satan, and they're to cause you to, to destroy you. Okay? Satan tempts to destroy us. God tests us to develop us. Okay? There's a difference between being tested and being tempted of the devil. Now, the Bible uses the same word, in both cases. But it's like many other things. That we have many words in the English language that ha- have dual meanings. And so don't get hung up on this and don't let anybody tell you it's a wrong translation. It is not. It says that no, God tempts no man. But it goes over in Genesis 22 and says God tempted Abraham. Okay? But it's the application of what's going on there. It's like judge not. Well, we know where to judge. It's the, it's the why are you judging? It says don't judge in one passage. In another passage it says to judge. The idea is, is what are you doing with it? What's the basis? What's the intent and the motive behind it? And that's the same way with, tempt- with the word tempted. The Bible uses the word tempt or temptation in two senses. One sense of the word temptation is a solicitation to do evil. That is from Satan. Satan will solicit you to do evil. God tests you or gives you trials, and it's never to cause you to do evil. God never tempts a man to do evil. God's trials and tests that he sends are for your spiritual growth and maturity and develop and strengthening, okay? Uh, the solicitation to do evil from Satan is what you have in Matthew chapter 4 when Satan came to Jesus. It's what you have in Genesis chapter 3 when Satan came to Eve. Solicitations to do evil. Testing under trial is what God did with Abraham when he asked him to offer his son Isaac upon the altar. It's also what Peter talked about in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, when he talked about the trial of your faith and, and you know, the temptations that come, they're going to purify you and they're going to grow you in the Lord. And so that's the difference. And I think that it's important tonight, as we're looking at this thing of being tempted, because I am telling you, there's no temptation taking you, but such is common to man. You're going to be tempted. And if, if there's anything I think as Christians we need to learn, is how do we deal with temptations? And we, we need, if, if it's going to be part of our life and it's going to happen to us, better learn how to deal with it. Okay? So now you can go to your handout and you can write in some stuff tonight. Number one, the truth about temptations is to acknowledge the reality of temptation. Acknowledge the reality of it. I want to say something to you tonight. It is not a sin to be tempted. It is not a sin to be tempted. Every person in this building is going to be tempted by Satan, God will allow you to be tempted to do evil. Just go through the Bible. Number one, your Savior was tempted. The Bible said he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. That's the difference. 
but he was tempted. He was fully God. He was fully man. And he was tempted and the temptation was real. But he never gave in to it. He never surrendered to it. And he never sinned. He never yielded to that temptation. Eve was tempted. And there, by the way, if you want to study out and know what every temptation will have in it, study, it's the three aspects that she had. And I'm not going to go into those tonight, but she was tempted in three areas. Christ was tempted in the same three areas. And you'll always be tempted in those three areas. Uh, Joseph was tempted. Potiphar's wife. And it was continual, repeated, repeatedly. Uh, Job was tempted to curse God and die. Uh, Noah was tempted and got drunk. Abraham was tempted to lie, and he did. Moses was tempted to disobey about the rock, smiting the rock. Elijah was tempted to murmur against the Lord, and he did. David, of course, was tempted. Uh, Jonah was tempted to run from God, and he did. Peter was tempted to deny the Lord, and he did. Mark, in the New Testament, was tempted to bail out on the ministry, and he did. So what I'm saying to you tonight is this. Acknowledge the reality of temptations. I just think sometimes we want to act like it's not there. It's there. And every saint of God is going to deal with it and be tempted. And the Bible says there's no temptation taking you, but such is common to man. 1 Corinthians 10, 12, and 13 says, (coughs) But God is faithful, who will with not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. But will with the temptation make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So that's a very important verse about the whole subject of temptation is God says it's common, but God is faithful and he's going to work with you. He's not going to suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. Temptation is a reality of life and it's a reality of life all life long. There's nothing. Now I'm going to say this to you again. There's nothing wrong with you because you're tempted. Don't let the devil just say, well, there must be something wrong with you. Or you're, you're not spiritual. Or, you know what? The fact that you're being tempted so much might mean, might, might be determining the value that you have in God's army. Because the more you're doing for the Lord, the more Satan would want to knock you out. So I just want to get this down tonight. Now I'm going to tell you something. You'll be a little bit, maybe blunt. But I remember as a late teenager and, uh, in the early twenties struggling with, with, Physical, fleshly lust. And I remember telling God, or kind of in my way of doing things, well, Lord, if this is so wrong, why did you make me like you made me? Why do I have these physical desires if, if, if it's so terrible and so wrong? What I didn't understand was that God designed them within the perimeters of his word. Now, maybe I understood that, but I didn't want to. You know, but I'm just saying this. It was like, well, why do you have all this battle all the time? Why do you have this struggle about this stuff, you know? So anyway, the first thing is to acknowledge the reality of temptation. Don't think it's terrible or that you're some kind of a low-down, worthless dog because you're tempted. That's not true. All men are going to be tempted. It's what you do with the temptation that's going to make a difference. Number two, this is important. Assume personal responsibility. Assume, assume the personal responsibility in temptation. This is where things go wrong. Eve, what did Eve do with her, about her failure in temptation? When God came, she said, Adam, what Adam do? Or Adam, well, Adam, he put it off on Eve and Eve put it off on the devil. You saw one of the first things about temptation is when we yield to temptation, the tendency is not to take personal responsibility. I'm here to tell you tonight that God holds you and I personal, personally responsible for what we do with t- the temptations that come to our life. We are personally responsible. Uh, God's going to test us to strengthen our faith. James chapter 1 and verse 13 said, Let no man say when he is tempted that I am tempted of God. Don't blame God and don't blame everybody else. It says, For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Well, here it is. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. God's going to test you. He's going to allow you to be tested. He's going to strengthen your faith. But God will never test you to subvert your faith. You need to understand that. The reason, one of the reasons I bring this out is that uh, Sigmund Freud has had a horrible Im- impact on American culture. 
One of his basic tenets of, of his philosophies was his false philosophies. But he took this. He did an old satanic trick. He took a truth in nature and applied it, misapplied it to your spiritual life. And here's what it was. Fruit said, you're not responsible if you get cancer. You're not responsible if you get sugar diabetes. It's not your fault. It's not your fault if you, if you have all of a sudden a mental, you know, some kind of a mental uh, situation or uh, name me some other disease that you might get. Huh? Alzheimer's. It's not your fault that you got Alzheimer's. And he would go through this list of physical maladies and diseases and say, are you, are you responsible because you got cancer? I mean, is it your fault? Is it your fault because you got sugar? And, and of course, the obvious answer is, well, no. And then he took that and moved and said, neither it is your fault because you have moral failure. It is part of the whole system, just like the physical maladies. And he took that and shoved that over. Now, here was his deal. So he said this, watch it. You are not personally responsible for your sin of what the, what the church calls sin. You're not personally responsible for what the world would call your failures or your sin. And brother, I want to tell you something. It has permeated our culture to no end. And people now, when they, when they fall into sin or moral failure, whatever it may be, they want to blame God and everybody else and never take personal responsibility for it. Now I'm going to tell you tonight, this is where you'll get yourself in trouble. The curse to our country is no personal responsibility. Let me tell you something. If Reg Kelly falls and sins, it's Reg Kelly's fault. It's not all the naked women walking around's fault. It's not the internet's fault. David didn't have internet. David didn't have Playboy. David didn't have all that stuff. No, and you go all the way back. It, this is not a new thing. This has been common. This is why it's common to man, okay? So the one thing tonight is assume personal responsibility. If you don't assume personal responsibility in the area of temptation, you, your life's ruined. You're shot. If all you're going to do is blame everybody else and blame this, there are men who blame their wives. Well, she just doesn't meet my need, and, and she just blah, blah, blah. And wives who say, well, my husband's just not romantic, and on and on and on and on it goes. As justification for why they want to be unfaithful to their spouse. I'm here to tell you tonight from the Word of God, God wants you and I to assume personal responsibility about our temptations. And it's nobody else's fault, and it's not your wife's fault, and it's not your husband's fault, and it's not anybody else's fault, it's not God's fault, it's not some, as I said, indecently dressed woman's fault, although that ought not be. It's, it, I'm telling you, we need to have personal responsibility. If we don't, you don't need to expect to have a, a power over temptation in your personal. So you need to get it down, assume personal responsibility. Number three, this is big, anticipate the routine of temptation anticipate the routine of it. You say, what do you mean? Can I tell you, what is, what is the routine? It's going to happen. Just, you can just figure. It's going to be regular. You need to assume, or, or an, an, not assume, but anticipate the fact that you're going to be tempted, that there's going to be a routine of it. That the, I mean, say, what did Satan do in Jesus? He gave him one temptation and stop? No. He gave him the second one, and he gave him the third one. And the Bible said that he... Left him for a season. That wasn't the last time Jesus was tempted. It's just what the Bible records. You and I need to anticipate. I, I, in, in studying for this message, I read the story of a pastor, a preacher that was like in his 80s. And he had a young pastor that he was kind of mentoring who was in his 20s, okay? Mid-20s. And they had went to eat breakfast together, and they were kind of, you know, he was kind of mentoring him and so forth. And they came out of this little rest cafe and were heading down the street, and there is this gorgeous, seducingly dressed young lady walking straight toward him. And this young pastor tells the story. He said, he said, my eyes were just like, woof. You know, I mean, he said, I just, I, honest to goodness, he said, wow, that, that gal is, she's, woof. And he said, but I'm holding it all within the framework. I did not want to look unspiritual in the presence of this 80-some-year-old pastor. But he said, and he said it almost like it got tense as she passed by and we were walking on down the sidewalk. All of a sudden, he said, I decided to just get honest. And I just looked over him. I said, do you ever have any trouble? Did you used to have trouble with that? 
And the 80-year-old man said, I still do. And there'll never be a time when you don't fight it. You know what he said that helped me? That you need to anticipate the fact, the truth about it is, the older you get, the more temptations you're going to have. They're going to maybe vary. They're going to be different than what they used to. But temptations don't just stop. And we're not just talking about the immoral temptations. I know that's the primary here of David's life. But we're just talking about any kind of temptation, okay? You need to anticipate the routine of temptation. It's in James chapter 1 and verse number 14. The Bible says, if you want to write that reference down on number 3, the Bible said, every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And he said, uh, then when lust hath conceived, it bring forth sin, and sin is finished, bring forth death. There's a routine of this thing. I'm telling you, it will just, here, here's the routine. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you five words. I'll start with E, so get ready to write somewhere there. Number one, and you, by the way, you can watch this in David's life. You can read that second Samuel 11, verses one through five, and you'll see it. Boom, boom, boom. Number one is excitement. Excitement. Now you listen to me. We're a fallen creature, and one of the most, Powerful instincts that you have is the physical mating instinct. Okay? Number one is excitement. And I want to tell you tonight, men are excited by the sight of a, what do you call it? Attractive woman. Apart from, apart from spiritual strength and spiritual power in his life, and even with that, I'm telling you, there's, hey, there's a reason they sell everything from soap to cars with women. So, you know, they know you sit here tonight and trying to act spiritual about it. Well, you know, this, I mean, they know what they're doing. There is a reason that cheerleaders and football games are out there and why the camera focuses down hard on them. Now, I don't watch it, ain't watched it for years, but I, I know that's what they do. And there's a reason that cheerleaders aren't dressed in dresses down their ankles. And everything you, I mean, constantly, you need to understand there is a routine out there. It is constantly, constantly, constantly. You may have victory this week, and if you're not careful next week, here come the routine. And you thought, oh my goodness, man, I've got this thing. I'm, I, I've got, no, my, God is teaching us that this thing is not going to stop just because you get to be 35 or 40 or 45 or 50 or 60 or whatever. This temptation, in fact, of it is, here's the deal. The farther you go, you see, I, I believe this, that Satan... There were some other issues, and we talked about this about women with David. But Dave, watch this. Watch this. Where was David at in the point of his life? He was king of all Israel. This did not happen <coughs> when he was a shepherd boy. This did not happen when he had just killed Goliath. This did not happen when he was out in the wilderness. This did not happen when he was just king of Judah, of two tribes. This this happened after he had been made king over all 12 tribes of Israel, firmly established as the leader of that nation, as the one that the nation was looking to for leadership. And boom! It's a routine. Number one is excitement. The visualization. The visualization uh, affects sight and imagination. And I, I want to say this to the ladies here tonight. And it's, just, it's just a fact of life. It, it is important for you to be dressed in a, in a godly, modest way. Uh, you know, that's not to make excuse for any, any of us men, because I'm telling you, you know, that's not to make any excuse. But, w- but please understand, the Bible has a lot to say about modesty and dressing modestly and especially about women. You know why? Because God, God knows us, and God knows what immodesty does when, when a man sees it. And I will be honest with you, it's worse. It's worse than your husband's ever told you. If your husband was honest with you, it's worse than he's ever told you. It got quiet in here. And Satan knows it, and it's very, very powerful. And I'm going to tell you something. You, you remember this. If Satan can take down a man called David... Ain't nobody in this world that can't be taken down if they're not on guard. The second thing is enticement. That's when the Bible said they're drawn away of their own lust. You see, David looked at her. He got excited. I mean, and I just want to stay off. Here's what I want to stay off. And I want to get on this thing. You know, yeah, I'm sure his palace balcony was up there. He shouldn't have been laying in bed in the afternoon. Okay. He should have been up in bed. I know all that. But he gets up from, you know, a nap, which is not a good sign there. And he's walking out to the balcony. 
And Bathsheba is bathing herself in view of where somebody like that could see. That's not smart. And Bathsheba may have been, she may have been an adulteress in her mind already. She may have, her husband was gone to war. And there have been a lot of Dear John letters over the centuries. Okay? But we're not going to mess with her right now. Okay? What we're going to do with David's deal like that, I'm not going to jump into conclusions about what she was or wasn't doing and what was going on in her mind. I'm going to deal with the personal responsibility that David had. But what happened was, because she was there, he became enticed. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You men may need to help me a little bit. What went through David's mind when he looked over there and saw this, and the Bible said she was a beautiful woman, bathing herself. What went through his mind? Besides the fact of, woof. Huh? A little peak won't hurt. I want to go further. What went through his mind? What's she doing up there bathing herself in view? Is she... uh, is she advertising? No. I'm, yeah. True. Well, you know, but no, but not another man's wife. I, I, I'll, I'll say it another man, but I know what y'all mean. He took her. Okay. He had power. He had power. Okay. Misused power. But what we're saying is, what went through his mind to begin to justify this? Because I'm going to tell you something. There's an old the old timers used to have saying, "If it's not for sale, don't advertise it." If it's not for sale, don't advertise it. Basically, that, that, and this is an old deal. This, this is what runs through uh, the mind. If a woman presents herself in that kind of manner, he assumes she's, she's looking for somebody. She's advertising. Okay? And uh, I'm telling you something. This is a big subject, and I'm trying to be discreet and everything, but we've got a rape culture now. And it's, I mean, I'm telling you, it's bad. We got a situation now where our ladies can't go anywhere with that. We want, we, we worry about our wives constantly. And what's happening is there's the inflame, the inflaming because of all the immodesty and all the immorality and all the filth that's out there. It is inflaming. I'm telling you, it's inflaming the base lust of people. And I'm telling you, it's like all bars will hold back. Anything's, anything, and when a man sees a woman who's scantily clad or looks seductively dressed, he just figures, he, you know what his instincts say? She's available. I just need to get the right setup going. So there's the enticement. Then thirdly, there's the entrapment. The entrapment comes, it's kind of like a hook. You see, the enticement is the bait, but the entrapment is the hook. <clears throat> and I'm going to tell you something. This, this, this is what happened. He got excited, he got enticed, and took her, sent for her, took her over, lay with her, and then the hook, then the fish, then the old, the old tempter, Satan, set the hook. She conceived. And uh, from there on, it was on. She sent word back, I'm a child. The hook had been set. David was at that moment entrapped. At the moment of entrapment, he has to start lying like a wild dog. He literally starts lying, 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 and he starts committing every command, violation of every commandment. You, you, you go down through the Ten Commandments, he got them all right there. He dishonored his father. What do you think his father Jesse thought about it? Dishonored his father and mother. I mean, it, the whole thing. He stole another man's wife. He wound up murdering somebody. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. All the commandments. And so he got entrapped. The hook was set. Then the fourth thing is endorsement. Now, there's an endorsement, and that's when you when it's conceived. It said, when sin hath conceived. And I want to tell you, this is a weird thing. Once, once a person has been excited, once a person has been enticed, once a person has been uh, entrapped, this is, this is weird. I'll show you the depravity man. He begins to endorse his own sin. And what happens, now think about this. There's a word in that, in James chapter 1, verse number uh, um, 15. Watch this. Watch this. When lust hath conceived. Hmm. I wonder why the Holy Ghost used a word, the word conceived. Here's what happens. When you bring to union the will and lust, 
You have a conception. And that sin is conceived in the heart. And here's, and here's the deal. It may not have been, the birth may not have come yet, but the conception's there. Can I say something to you? There's nobody I ever knew or heard tell of or read of in the whole world that just all of a sudden decided one day, I'm going to commit adultery. Bless God, I'm just going to go commit adultery. What happens? The will is united to the lust and is conceived. And that conception may sit in the heart for nine months, six months, but it's conceived in there already. It's already conceived. You see, people just don't go out and do this, boom, boom, all of a sudden. They guess there's a conception that's happened in the heart. And it's the union of your will has surrendered to your lust, and those things come together, and boom, there's a conception. And the conception may not be seen for a while. What was what did David try to do for a while? Before it could be seen, he tried to do all that stuff to make it look like it was her husband's child. Okay. Then there, number five <coughs> is enslavement. David became for the rest of his life a slave to what to his lust. I want to read you what an old preacher wrote. He said, "You can choose your actions, but you don't get to choose the results." You can choose your kicks, but you don't get to choose the kickbacks. And you can choose, you can make your choices, but you don't choose the consequences. There is a, we're talking about the routine of temptation. There is a predictable routine of temptation, and that's why God wants us to have the wisdom of how to deal with temptation and how to conquer temptation in our life. You know, here's the goal. What am I preaching this for tonight? Here's the fact of it. We're all going to be tempted. God wants us as his children to have power in our lives, truth in our lives, wisdom in our life, to not respond to that temptation in a sinful way. Not to be conquered by it, defeated by it, enslaved by it. Destroy us. Let me just say to you tonight. If it weren't for the grace of God tonight, I'd be out of the ministry. Okay? I want to tell you something. I thank God tonight that I've never committed, never touched another woman since I've met that woman right there. But I'm going to tell you tonight, if it hadn't been the grace of God, I probably would have. Okay? There have been two preachers, two pastors in this little town of Norwood that went down with immorality in their churches right here in Norwood that I know of. One of the best pastor friends I've ever had in my life went down just about three years ago. In immorality. He's trying to fix his marriage up right now. I told you that 40% of the pastors in America, watch this now. This is phone call, this is phone call interview. This is survey. 40% of them admitted to committing adultery in their marriage. Right, the pastors in America right now. This is not a little issue. It's a very powerful powerful thing that we're going to deal with and the whole purpose of this message is to you know what come the reality of it and say you know what we need to anticipate it and how we're going to respond to it and be ready for it and the reality of it so there's a predictable thing uh yielding to those satanic fleshly worldly temptations will every time and absolutely enslave your life it'll enslave your life and it'll ruin your life and we're going to be talking more about david's the things the results of david's things number four if you want to write this down Number four, activate the replacement of temptation. It's real important to replace temptation. You have to replace it with something. You have to replace it with truth, righteousness, light, and wisdom. Verse number 17 of James chapter 1 says, isn't it amazing? This is wild. Just think about this for a second. He's talking all along of chapter 1 about temptation, and all of a sudden he says this phrase in verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift Cometh down from the Father, look what it says there. It says, cometh down from above, and cometh down from the Father lights, and who is no variable as a shadow turning. Of his own will beget he us the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. After he just got through talking about 
How is this connected? You know what he's telling us? He is saying that you have got to replace temptation with the truth of God's word. You have got to replace it, the, uh, uh, the lies that Satan is throwing at you. Now, all right, here's, here's, what, what's, what's the lie Satan's going to tell you in the sin of lust? That, oh, this is going to fulfill you. This is going to make you happy. This is, boy, this will, this is going to bring, bring you great pleasure. And you and the Bible talks about pleasure for, of sin for a season. This is going to fulfill you, man. You, you, you know, this is going to do it. Well, what is that? That's a lie. It's not going to make you happy. It's going to ruin your life. It's going to ruin your life. And it's going to ruin your life the rest of your life. Okay? What is he talking about here? He says replace that, how to conquer temptation. is. Here's what Satan is. How, does anybody besides me? Satan's always telling you that you're getting shortchanged or, or you, know, um, you know, something. That you're not, you know, that, that there's something. The grass is greener on the other side. That's the best good old way to put it. Always telling you that the grass is greener on the other side. Something of that nature. What God wants us to replace the truth with is that God has given us every good gift. We are not being shortchanged. We are not being cheated. There isn't something better on the other side of the fence. He's saying every good gift cometh from above. God has already provided us with everything that we need. Everything that he's given us is good for us. And if you believe this lie, you've got to replace that lie with God's truth. And I'm telling you, that's not the easiest thing in the world to do with a carnal mind. You've got to get the word of God in your heart and say, you know what? Uh, I'm telling you right now, let's think about this for just a second. Oh, let's just think about it. And I don't, you know, I'm just going from, all right, let's just say that, that I commit adultery on Karen and we wind up splitting up. Do you think there's ever going to be any more good Sunday afternoons like we had this evening, Ben? Karen and I was talking on the way to church, kids. What a blessing we are experiencing in life. We, you know, we, we have, not every Sunday, but most Sundays, we get together and after church we have dinner. And it's a blessed time. We celebrate birthdays and we just have a great time. But I want to tell you something. If I'm unfaithful to that woman right there, you know what's going to happen? That's going to be the end of that, Hannah. There'll be no more times when kids come up here to pulp, uh, come up here to pew and say, Papa, you got a, you got a cough drop. Do you understand what God's trying to tell you? God is saying, look at all the good, wonderful things that you have in Jesus Christ, what God has done for you, and start thinking about what you're going to lose if you do this stupidity. God has already given you these wonderful, all the good. If it's good, it came from God. And it is good. I pull that stunt, there's no more. Seven birthday candles and a birthday cake on Sunday afternoon and the grandkids were getting up there and getting all excited about blowing the candles out and us singing happy birthday. No, I'm sitting in some hole somewhere after Satan's deceived me. Is this making sense? God is saying, activate the replacement of temptation. Understand that God is good to you. God has blessed you. God has been wonderful to you. Don't believe these stinking lies. It's going to be greener on the other side. It's going to be better. It's not. It's a lie. <clears throat> Satan tell you, you're, you know, that you're missing out or whatever it is or something. I don't know what, but God's made every provision we ever need. We got to go. I'm, I'm kind of messing this thing around. Number five, accept the reason for temptation. Verse 18 says this in James chapter 1, of his own will beget he us with the word of truth. We're his children. Okay? Because you're God's child, you're going to be a target. And just everybody in this church just will get it down tonight. The further you go on your Christian life, the better, bigger target you are. <clears throat> One of the biggest targets in the Bible was a man by the name of Job. You know what the Bible said about him? He was a perfect and upright man who eschewed evil and so forth. He was looked at throughout the whole country. He was looked at probably throughout many other continents because of his business exchanges there in the, in the promised land. And if God, if Satan could take him down, what would it do to the name of Christ? And if you're here tonight, you're saved, you're a born again Christian, I'm going to tell you something. 
it hurts, it blasphemes the name of Christ when we fall into sin. What did Nathan the prophet tell David? By this deed you have given occasion for the enemies of God to blaspheme. Again, I'll just use my own self. If I mess up and I, and I, and I mess my life up and I yield to temptations and, and so forth. And by the way, again, we're going to be tempted. But if I don't do what I ought to do and, and submit to God and get the power of God in my life and be obedient to God and do what's right. Let me tell you right now, wouldn't it be something across the country if word got out next week, Reg Kelly run off of somebody else? What damage would I do to young people for generations to come? <clears throat> the reason we're tempted is because we're targets. We're children of God. We've been born again of the Spirit of God. Verse 18 there. We're God's children. Now I'll tell you, that's who he's after. And you need to get a hold of this. We're talking about the truth about temptation. You say, I don't know why I feel so tempted all the time. I can tell you why. Because if you yield to it, Satan's going to have a heyday. Tell everybody in the country there's nothing to your faith. He's going to blaspheme God's name all over the country. That's why. The temptation, the struggle itself is proof that of who we are and how we're hated and how we're targeted by Satan. <clears throat> but God allows it. God allowed Joseph to be tempted. God allowed Job to be tempted. God allowed David to be tempted. God allowed Abraham to be tempted. He's going to allow us to be tempted. Now I'm going to give you a little something that God has given me. And I I certainly have not, uh, you know, I failed God over the years. Probably will again, but don't want to. But I'm going to tell you a visualization that I have. I can connect old Don's in, me and him, just a rough piece of wood. But Don, here's what I do. I visualize this. I'm being tempted, okay? Ain't nobody in the world knows it. She don't know it. Zach don't know it. Nathan don't know it. Ben don't know it. I'm being tempted. And here's what I try to visualize. Now, next Sunday, we're going to give you another visualization that will help you in overcoming temptation. But here's what I do. Terry, I remember that in the book of Revelation, it says that the accuser of the brethren accuses us before the Lord. So, Brother Dennis, here's what I visualize. God's on his throne. Satan is standing over there ready to accuse. God allows a temptation to come. And if I yield to that temptation, the adversary of my soul turns to my heavenly father and says, look at him. Look at him. And he blasphemes the name of God because of what I did. And I try to visualize the shame and reproach and the dishonor that will bring to my heavenly father. I've added something else to it in the last two weeks. I don't know what my dad can see down here. But you know what I almost like to think? That my dad said, no, Reg, don't do that. Reg, don't do that. Now, again, I'm not saying my dad can see anything down here. I don't know that. But boy, I tell you what, it don't hurt for me to think about what would my dad say. About my dad having to turn and look at his heavenly father and say, I don't know why he did that. Lord, I so hate that. I'm so ashamed of what he did. And next Sunday, we're going to leave it here this week, leave it tonight for next Sunday. But I'm telling you, we need to have visualizations of what's really going on in the spiritual world when we yield to temptation and do wrong and accept and and, and, and temptation. Now, we said this, to accept the reason, I want to give you five words down at the bottom. <clears throat> Because it is not enough to recognize temptation and all this kind of stuff and so forth. There, we need to battle temptation. It is a battle. Okay? <clears throat> Number one, the word fight. You need to fight. The Bible said in James 4, 7, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. There's not much resisting anymore. <laughs> it's more of a sidling up and saying, what did you say? What did you recommend? <laughs> There's not much resisting going on. God says, fight the good fight of faith. Resist the devil. Resist him. And the Bible said the devil flee from you. That's pretty powerful. 
First Peter 5, 8 and 9 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, goeth about as a roaring lion, seeking, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. God says, hey, you resist. It'll help your other brethren to, know, to be able to resist. It'll encourage the other brother to resist that. He said, resist him. Don't just do what he asks you to do. Don't just do what he tempts you to do. Fight back. <clears throat> what did Joseph say? How can I do this and sin against my God? He was resisting. Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God. 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith. Matthew chapter 4, Jesus Christ resisted and he used the sword of the Spirit in that resisting. Number two, follow. This is important. It's not enough just to resist, to fight. We need to follow. The Bible said in James chapter 4, he said, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. I'm going to tell you something. I I want to get close to God. When you realize that you're being tempted, I mean, when Satan's really throwing it at you, buddy, the best thing you do is get your Bible, get close to God. I'm going to tell you another thing. Call your pastor. Call your daddy. Call somebody that loves God. Follow, follow, draw nigh to God. Get in the Bible. And I'm just saying, 1 Peter 2.21 says, follow in his steps, 1 Timothy 6, 11, O man of God, follow after righteousness and good godliness and faith and love and patience and meekness. Number three, the word flee. 1 Timothy 6, 11 says, flee these things. He's talking about the love of money there particularly. In 1 Corinthians 10, 14, he says, flee idolatry. 2 Timothy 2, 22, flee youthful lust. Genesis 39, 12, Joseph fled from Potiphar's wife. He ran. He ran so fast and so quick that she wound up with his coat. But he ran. There's times to stand and fight and we ought to always follow, but there is time to get out of there. Go! And go fast. Don't hesitate. It's your life. The Bible said, He knoweth not it is for his life. Sometimes our response is to flee. We ought to always fight. We ought to always be following the Lord, drawing nigh to God, staying in touch with godly friends, godly people that we know have our best in mind. But sometimes you just need to get out of there. Sometimes there's there's no other choice but to get out. I'm going to tell you, young people, listen to me tight, and all of us adults, if you don't flee, you'll fall. If you don't flee, you will fall into it. Number four is fellowship. And I want to encourage you in this. The Bible said if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Okay? Fellowship. Hang around the fellowship with God and, and godly people. Evil communications corrupt good manners. You hang around the wrong people, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Fellowship. Proverbs 13, 20, He that walketh with the wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. And it's important that we fellowship with the right kind of people. I want to tell you young people something. I don't know your personal life. That's your mom and dad's deal. I'm just your old sorry low-down preacher. But I want to tell you one thing. If you're hanging around here in the back of church and some kid's back there and he's talking the wrong kind of junk, you get you another friend and get him another friend, get you another friend fast. You go use the bathroom. They want to stop and talk to you about dirt and garbage. You get right on past them. Just put up your hand and say, don't need that. Have enough, tough enough time the way it is. Leave me alone. <clears throat> Make sure that your fellowship is with God and with godly people. And then finally, feed. The word, the, the last number five is feed. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalms 1, blessed are the man that meditates in the word of God day and night. I'm telling you something. If you read Proverbs chapter 5, Proverbs chapter 6, Proverbs chapter 7, Proverbs chapter 9, and read about what happened to these people who did not, who did not conquer temptation, it will help you. It will help you. You're thinking about, you're thinking about yielding temptation? See over the hill. Go to David's life. See what happened over the hill. Go to Samson's life. See what happened over the hill. When you're thinking about, oh, hey, you know, everybody's doing it and it won't be that bad and, and I'll just, you know, I, I'll just, you know, and it, it, it's just not that big a deal. You better read your Bible. Feed on the Word of God. I'm going to tell you, it is a big deal. Job said, I have steamed the words of my mouth more than, of your mouth more than my necessary food. He said, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maiden? He had ten grown children. Woo! 
Now, I'll say this and we're done. You and I will never outgrow temptation. But we can't overcome temptation. We can overcome it. I'll tell you right now, Brother Matt, we don't have to fall. Brother Gary, we don't have to fall. You fall, you choose to fall into it. Don't pull that old boy used to be on TV. Oh, the devil made me do it. No, you choose it. Now, I'm going to say something pulpit tonight. I'm your pastor, and I love you whether you think I do or not. <clears throat> Brother Lane Leggy, you be faithful to your wife. I believe you will be. But I don't ever want to hear that you took after another woman. If your, if your dad called me up and said, come help me whoop my boy, I'd, help, I'd come help him. <clears throat> huh? Do you know what? <laughs> you don't need no help? Okay, all right. Okay. But I want you to think, I want you daddies, hey, Ben, I want you to look in the eyes of them three boys tonight. And I want you to think about what happened. Nathan, I want you to look in the eyes of them kids tonight. And I want you to think about what happened. Zach, I want you to look in the eyes of your children tonight. It says the price, the price is too big. You love birds back here. Just, what, you just celebrate your second? Now I'm going to live to be 103 and you better still be married. Okay, I love you. You be faithful to her. You be faithful to him. Sam? What a be- I'll tell you what night I, we drove, Karen and I drove up to church and Sam and Becky and, and Tom and Sheila was walking in with all their kids. Now I'm honest with you, it's probably one of the prettiest sights I've ever seen in my life. It absolutely was just a beautiful sight of God's grace. Here's these two couples and just all these kids. And it's just beautiful. I want you to look at them. I want you to think about the cost. Just one. I'm going to tell you something. David's one night show never got over. And, and, I'm, and I'm going to promise you, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on David's sin. We may look at his consequences and a few things like that, but I'm not going to go up here and just go on and on about it. You've heard messages about it. But I just want to drive it home because we're just our little flock here in the middle of the country. But old Lonnie, I want us to stay together. I want our homes to stay together, and I want these kids to know what it is to have mom and daddy loved each other and stayed together. And Brother Rice, we're going to be tempted. There's no question about it. It's what we do with that temptation. And uh, I want you men to pray for your pastor. Nothing more the devil would like. Knock me out. I want to pray for you. And let's pray for each other. Hold each other up. All righty? I want to tell you something tonight. I believe with all my heart that if God... He's got enough power to save me from hell. He's got enough power to save me from temptation. I really believe that. The key's right here, whether I want it or not. Let's stand. Thank you for being here. I hope tonight that somehow or this might help you some old day along the trail. <laughs> We're just living in a day, Brother Terry, when every time you turn around, you're seeing something you just shouldn't be seeing. Amen? And uh, it's just, it's, you know... Anyway, why? Jim, you and Colleen, I want you guys to stay together. Boy, I tell you what, how hard would it hurt you kids, your mom and daddy split up? Wreck your life, wouldn't it? You pray for your parents. Don't you think they're not tempted? They're tempted. Oh, I tell you, we need to see beyond the little momentary pleasure, the little momentary excitement, and to serve the Lord. I probably shouldn't get so personal, but we need to pray one for another, and, and I mean that, and help each other. Joe, you're not past it either. Because right now is when Satan will probably come at you worse than the next 10 years, because now you've got a family.
Now it can really damage you. I'm going to encourage you all. Terry, would you dismiss us tonight from our service, please?